Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar uh, hosted by Multilingual. We're super excited to be here. Um, first of all, I'm going to introduce you a little bit to uh, our topic today, leveraging your digital presence. And after that, I will uh, introduce my distinguished guests. If you can't be found, you don't exist. That's the reality we live in today. So if you haven't invested in your digital presence until now, you basically have zero choice any longer. Your online presence consists of much more than just your website. We all think that the website is super, super important, but it also includes all of your social media platforms. In the new virtual reality that we live in now, we can't build our relationships face to face. We are all in different uh, lockdowns or, or at least most of us are now working from home voluntarily or not. Um, but what people find about you and your company online will help them now to determine if you are a reliable business partner or not. This is true not only for your company, but also for your personal brand. Statistics sh show that up to 60% of a buying decision has already been made by the time a potential buyer approach a vendor. So if they can't find any information about you, they won't probably buy from you either. So this will be a panel discussion with two, not three, amazing panelists. We had announced a third uh, person on the panel, but she couldn't unfortunately attend today. But we will discuss implications and opportunities, how to maintain your personal integrity on the social, in the social environment, and at the same time, put yourself out there to attract more business. It's not too late. If you haven't started your journey yet, it's not too late to start your digital journey. And I hope this conversation will help you to take the first steps and feel excited about all the new opportunities that it will bring to you and hopefully also to your company. Before I introduce my guests, some of you might know them already. Let's hear it from today's sponsor. Multilingual social media is a highly important tool to connect with your customers across channels. To successfully implement it, you need to work with local experts who have the experience of a particular culture. They are best suited to help you identify the cultural norms and expectations in each region. All globalization is ultimately local, and there's no substitute for human judgment and input to achieve the right words and subtext for effective global social media. Does it seem a little overwhelming? Lionbridge can help. Thank you very much. Um, so if you haven't figured that one out yet, it's Mario Line Gross Nibbling, who is not with us today uh, from Multilingual. It would have been super interesting to hear um, her story because our host, Multilingual, which used to be a traditional printed magazine, has gone through an amazing digital journey over the last year. And Mario Line is very much part of that journey. So we have to save that to another conversation. Uh, instead, I have two fellow Swedes with me today, Ansi and Tess. And I wanted to start with introducing Tess Witte with Swedish Translation Services. We met the first time, I think it was 2011, at a, a conference. We love conferencing when we can. It was the uh, Swedish Association for, for Professional Translators, SFÖ for short. And a year later, she was uh, a speaker at one of my conferences in Copenhagen. And um, it's been amazing to follow uh, the journey with you, Tess. Uh, and we have met in many exciting places. Last time, I think it was Palm Springs at the ATA conference a year and a half ago, yes. approximately. And uh, we have Ansi Kroll, a person that I met via social media. Uh, I found an amazing tweet. I'm a notorious Twitter, Twitterer. Anyone who knows me uh, can confirm that. And I, I read a tweet and I remember I sent you a direct message and say, hey, 
this is amazing. Would you like to come and speak at one of my conferences? And so you did at a conference in Malmo in 2015, perhaps, if I remember that correctly. But that's how I know you from a personal point of view. But I would like you to introduce yourself to our audience. Tess, would you like to start? Thank you. So my name is Tess Witte. I My background is in marketing. I studied international marketing and business communication. Uh, and it wasn't, but I've also studied a lot of languages. So it wasn't until we moved to the United States in 2001 that I started to look at other options. Um, and uh, after researching translation uh, for a bit and... Um, I decided that I can work from home and become a translator. So I did because I had little kids at home then. And uh, I benefited a lot from my marketing background in building my translation business. So in about 2010, I started uh, giving presentations and uh, workshops uh, on marketing for freelance translators or freelance linguists. And I have done that ever since. I have a podcast, um, which is very popular in the industry. Uh, I have published over 260 episodes. I've published two books. I have courses and workshops and webinars, all um, to um, help other translators market their businesses, which is my passion project. And I have been online, I think, ever since I could. I the One of the first things I did was to create a website back in 2003. That was a little bit more cumbersome than what it is today, right? It is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Tess. Uh, Ansi. Hi everybody, my name is Ansi Kirul and uh, I've been in communication and marketing um, plus 25 years or something. I started off um, at Ericsson when they were going digital in the mid 90s uh, and I was also digital brand manager for that brand for a while. Uh, I'm based in Sweden, I work globally and I have a background where I've been both an entrepreneur building my own agencies and companies within uh, communication and marketing as well as running and heading other people's firms as well. Today I'm an intrapreneur at Intrado Digital Media and um, you know I'm super passionate about the digital presence. The fact that you gave that story on how we met speaks volumes. Uh, I started my digital journey during university uh, when things was very new. I studied in the US because in, in Sweden in, at the universities it was still very much print so I have that background as well uh, and film and, and video and more classical kind of traditional um, communication. Um, and I just believe that there are so many opportunities. So I support our clients to be successful uh, with their communications by leveraging data and insights together with tech. Because to me, um, insights on, on you know, the data-driven part of it is key. And we didn't even mention search in the intro. So we're going to get back to that as well. That's good. Thank you very much. And I totally forgot to introduce myself as if everyone knows me. So my name is Anne-Marie Colliander Lind and um, I have been in the localization industry ever since I was born. That's how it feels, at least 30 years now. And um, the thing is that I tend to introduce myself as the person who's been forever in the industry but never translated anything but my own PowerPoint presentation. So I have been in marketing, I've been doing sales, I've been on the tech side, I've been on the business side, I've been on the research side. And since 10 years now, more or less, uh, I'm an independent consultant assisting primarily translation and interpretation companies in their growth uh, journey or any other with any other challenges they might have. So I see myself as a business coach and um, a mentor for companies and company owners. So enough said about me. Let's talk about the digital presence. We are forced into it or we love it. It's, it's you know, it's a love-hate relationship. And 
I was, as I said, an early adopter on some of these medias. But I think we have a lot of newcomers now because we have no choice. Uh, we need to be on, we need to be digital, we need to be present, we need to uh, have an appearance there. But do we have to be everywhere? That's that's my first question to my panelists. And um, I'm looking at Tess, you can tell, but I am. Um, do you think you have to be everywhere? Is that what digital presence is all about? No, I don't think so. And it's impossible to have a good presence everywhere. Um, I know, um, Anne-Marie, we were active on Twitter or we tweeted between each other a lot um, several years ago. And you probably have noticed that I am basically uh, not as active on Twitter anymore as I used to be. So what I want to, what I tell my students and what I've done myself, for me, my digital presence has been very important. I don't live where my clients live usually. Um, and most of my clients I have, I have found them online and through my digital presence. So it's very important. And I think you should be active where your clients are active. If that's what your, your goal is with your digital pre presence. Uh, I use almost all social media only for my business. Um, some, of course, Facebook for and Instagram privately too, but most of them I use for my business. And I think you should focus, if you're, especially if you're new, you should focus on one, maximum two social media platforms. I'm not talking websites anymore. Websites are a given, I think. Um, I'm talking social media. Focus on one or two and be really um, thorough and good and social on these platforms because that's what they are. Um, and I have noticed when I um, go through phases of being more active on one platform versus another, I notice uh, it takes a month or two or, th or sometimes, sometimes not even that, but I notice the difference right away uh, in engagement and, and contacts and potential clients reaching out. So First of all, focus on where your clients hang out if you want a social presence and go, but it also needs to be a platform that you enjoy. Hmm. So, I think that is a super important comment. If you're, if you don't, if you don't like it, it's yeah. very hard to engage with it. And yes. so did you want to, to uh, comment on that too? No, I mean, I can just echo that. It's so, so, so important to find the passion because if you don't enjoy it, it will show. Um, and understanding where you have your target group uh, is so important and also exploring what will have them engage. Because often when people start off, it becomes like a megaphone and they just keep on saying what they want to have said. Uh, but once you start to understand what value you can bring, to anyone in your target group and what they want to engage with, because you will see that, you know, just as Tess says, it, it will show in the data. So always follow your data. Um, so, so once you, you figure that one out, then you can start building momentum with your communications. Uh, and I, I, you know, I can only echo the fact that don't try to be everywhere because it's, it is time consuming. I remember, I remember back in the day in the 90s when everybody was building web pages and, and they would say that that technology was so great because it was for free. You know, it didn't cost anything. And then they realized that building a really good web page actually cost money and you couldn't have your, your kids do it every time. And then social media came along and it was the same argument, you know, oh, it's yeah. so great. It's for free. Uh, and everybody, you know, jumped on it and realized that it is, uh, it takes a bit of effort and you still need to have like your communication and marketing plan, um, you know, in front of you and understand what messaging you should be, um, be going with. But it's also fun because you can explore. It's, it's that kind of, it's social. Uh, so mm -hmm. you will get direct feedback if you're doing it in a good way, or if you need to tweak something. I think you mentioned something that is really, really important here. And that's what I stress when I talk to my clients or anyone who asks my advice is that you need to have a strategy. 
You need to have a strategy uh, for your business, for your goals, for everything you do. And a, a strategy is never as good as it can't be changed. I mean, if you if you realize that your strategy doesn't work, you need to change it and tweak it, as you said. And I, I believe also that if you choose to not be on a certain media, it's good to be there. And the strategy, even if the strategy is not to be on Instagram, I think it's good to mark your spot by having an account. But the, the one and only message there is to say, hey, I'm glad you found me here on Instagram, but I'm more active on LinkedIn. Here's my profile. Mm -hmm. Because you don't really know where your customer might find you. Or is that a bad strategy, Tess? Would you argue against that? No, I think if you have that message, then it works, but not if you just create a profile and then forget about mm. it. So, and I also wanted to point out that um, the the platform you choose, but because it's so important that you like it, is because you should consider it a giant uh, social networking meeting. And think of it that way. You don't go into a giant in a social networking meeting just to hand out business cards and say, here I am, this is me. You go there to interact and ask questions. And um, so that should be at the back of your intentions and strategy to, to, to understand that it's social and that you need to interact and ask questions so and be true. polite. <laughs> Yeah. So um, someone said that there is there is no right way to have it. To, to say that there is a right way uh, of doing social media is to say that there is a right way of having a conversation. And there isn't really. But there are certain unwritten rules on how you have a conversation. And that's one of them. Be polite and be nice. Mm -hmm. My father always said, if you don't have anything nice to say, maybe you shouldn't say something at all. Mm -hmm. But I, if, if I can just, uh, you know, because I think this is really interesting when it comes to like being social digitally and especially with people we don't know. Um, I'm I'm quite a lot on LinkedIn. I'm not as active right now because I've just, you know, workload and everything, you know, once again, time, it is time consuming. Um, but one thing that I do still try to put time into is grow my network uh, and try to find people that I both can benefit from where they can bring value to me and I can learn from them, as well as if I feel that I should have this person in my network because we could collaborate or something like that. But it's amazing to me that so many people connect on LinkedIn in. So they tap me on the shoulder and say, could we connect? And then when I look at their profile and say, yeah, why not? You know, we connect. And I don't hear a word. If you if you go to a conference and you connect with somebody, you know, we shake hands, we say hello, we do the quick introduction. Who are you? Who are who am I? We need to do that on LinkedIn, too. That's the whole point of growing a network, because if we don't get to know each other, we won't understand how that value can, can come. And, and that's one thing that I really want everybody to start thinking about, how often we connect without saying, thank you for connecting. This is me. This is what I can, can give to you. If you have any questions, please reach out. The worst thing we can do is connect and then send a pre-fixed message mm -hmm. with a cell. You know, so there are some, some do's and don'ts, but I think that that social connection, because I learned so much from my network on LinkedIn and I try to have a wide network on LinkedIn. So I don't end up in a cluster where we all, all know each other and it's the same people all, all over and over and over again, like to get that fresh ideas and and sort of input and of course i use it for sales obviously yes. yes because that's i mean that's the ultimate goal here i mean if, if you want to uh, grow your business you need to find customers and if you want to find customers when you find customers you need to be able to sell to them but and, and uh, i must say i i really like this um politeness and, and the engagement on LinkedIn. I'm trying to follow my own um, advice on that, but the warning clock is always this because you have a moment and you go to LinkedIn and you 
find interesting people and is that connect. Oh no, because there you cannot have the option of adding a personal mm-hmm. note. So that's a no go. <clears throat> Don't do that. And or yeah, if you do, if you do, when if they connect, then just then, send them a message afterwards. Yes, exactly. So and and. And so I have a question for you because you are good at data. So I am struggling with the algorithm on LinkedIn because I have two different audiences and I don't want to turn people down. There was a time when I said, oh, on LinkedIn, I focus on my uh, translation business. If, if you are a translator, please connect with me here. But... Um, I have noticed that it is important that I also speak to that audience on LinkedIn. So I'm kind of torn because I know the algorithm works. Uh, I don't want to create this little pool either. Um, Do you have any advice on on how to do that? Well, I think that, you know, it all comes down to content because if you deliver content to to several target groups, Hopefully you will be able, and there are tricks of using hashtags and, you know, interacting with with people that you want to engage with. So one thing is the type of content that you put out, but it's also a matter of who you connect with and also who you engage with. A lot of people forget that the algorithm will check who you are interacting with. So you need to be active. It's not about how many posts you put in. Uh, well, we can speak volumes on all the different types we should be doing to, to keep the algorithm. I call the, the algorithm for the cookie mon- monster mm-hmm. because it's like you always have to feed it. Mm -hmm. And that's the stress, I think, that Mm -hmm. I struggle with anyways. Uh, But also to interact with the different audiences and comment and sort of put your point across, because that will also weigh in to how you are being pushed out into your your network. Uh, But it is it is difficult when you have multiple uh, messaging. It's like me. I, I have two special specialities in in my role today. I work a lot with webcasting and virtual events. uh, And I work a lot with data and insights uh, for PR and communication and marketing. Uh, Those are related. But when I give tips and tricks on one end, it will be very focused on what should we think about when we do these type of activities. And then on the other end, it can be how do I pick my best KPIs? Um, And I, I sort of just, I go with the flow, I try to put things out there and I can see in my data what uh, audience is in engaging with what content. So I just try to push that as much as possible um, and just sort of, you know, and then, you know, video, then I see I get emails, I get other types of engagement. If I do just a, a regular image and a post, um, it's just comments or likes. So there is a lot to learn on each platform, not only LinkedIn. It's the yeah. same with Twitter. Yeah. But so I, I speak. Is, sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm, no, I'm on the right track then when I, because the feed is very cluttered, that I click on the hashtags. I follow the hashtags and try to comment on those. And yeah, hashtags and companies you want to engage with, yeah. uh, reaching out to people that you think are thought leaders yes. um, and, and sort of so that you get, because it, it's a matter of um, having those interesting conversations. And yeah. I always try to think about, am I bringing value? by mm-hmm. doing this, this, mm-hmm. not, yep. you know, me, 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 mm-hmm. because if mm-hmm. I bring value, it should be you, 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 <laughs> <laughs> it will be me, me, me. So it's, you know, just how you, I always talk about, don't see it as like a, a one-to-one relation. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's like just moving the pieces to, to win the game. Yes. So I, I wanted to break that into the conversation about, I mean, you now, Ansi, you represent the company. Of course, so do I, Test as well. Uh, but we also have this balance between the company and me, the brand me. Now, uh, I think for, for freelancers, often me and the brand is sort of interconnected. But I have a tendency to engage more with people than with brands. How do you, as for your company, how can you 
leverage the company's digital presence on medias like, well, say Twitter and LinkedIn, both of them the same. Any any advice on that? Any any tweaks you can do to have more engagement? Well, I think that, you know, if we look at data and, and my experience with clients uh, when they've been doing this, um, we often see that the people behind the company is actually gaining more followers and um, sort of having more engagement and, and everything. Um, so it's a matter of making these um, accounts work together. Uh, I think that um, you can never... As a company, it all depends. You know, if you're your own company, you usually have two accounts and you try to like put things out from both uh, and try to get some some movement in that. But if you're with like we're we're a big company, like so so we have quite a lot of content going out. And um I think and you can't you can't pressure anyone to share company um content. You know, that has to come from that person. My experience is that you usually get a lot more out of it if uh, employees engage in their own way when they feel like it, because that's when they show their passion, what they think was really good. Um, because I've had clients who had these policies where people should be like resharing or liking or commenting on mm -hmm. all the stuff that the client does or all that the um, company does. And it just creates these clusters. Uh, so I think that there should be more trust in the employees and see them as an asset uh, and be happy when they share. Uh, and also realize that it's not all personality types in a company that will do that. Not all will be on social media. Uh, so it's a balance. Um, it's it's easier when it's an entrepreneur with their own company because they stay in control uh, in a different way. But large companies, there are some really good examples where they've managed to get their uh, employees to bloom in their own sense without always sharing company information, yet sharing the company culture, the story um, that really resonates. And I know from my client's perspective that it, it gives them sales. Um, I want to add, if you as a company encourage your employees to like and um, comment on social media posts, the algorithm tweaks it so that the things that they don't only want to hear from each other instead of um, bringing it out there. Of course, they should share and like and comment, but if they... It can backfire if you encourage your employees to to like and comment on your own post because then the algorithm will think that they want to hear more from each other. And exactly, and it becomes a, it becomes a cluster. Mm -hmm. And and uh, also, um, one has to sort of think about depending on how new you are to a platform and all these. Now we're just talking a lot about LinkedIn just because it is so such a good professional network where a lot of sales and and sort of marketing is happening today uh, but also it's a matter of uh, of sort of understanding that anything we engage with so all these threads that people start like oh they put out somebody puts out a uh, um, a content a piece of content and says anyone who thinks like this please comment you know the only thing that's happening is that that is building for the algorithm for that person. Mm -hmm. So, so it's like you you also have to think about what I engage with will impact what I see, yes. what the algorithm thinks that I like. Um, it's not certain that it will give me anything. And more and more of these platforms are putting in um, – different types of tweaks to make sure that this sort of feeding loop of just liking each other and building uh, an audience would be beneficiary. So, and it's the same, you know, looking at like one of the new platforms right now, Clubhouse, where we saw in the beginning weeks of Clubhouse, how these sort of uh, clusters of people just started liking each other because a lot of followers on Clubhouse would make you uh, draw big audiences into the rooms. 
Um, but that doesn't mean that it's valuable content that you will be listening to. So, so it is. It, it is. Uh, you, I think that you have to just stay true to your um, sort of, but both your own business and your own message. But also, how do I bring value to the the target group that I want to reach? And it takes time. Mm-hmm. Do you know, Ansi? I mean, I mean, we're talking a little bit about quality versus quantity, right? So. If I have an audience, I want to know that it's the right audience. It's the people that want to listen to what I have to say. They are interested in what I can share with them. Uh, And in the earlier days of social media, especially, it was all of these, you know, buying uh, followers. And then they tweaked the algorithm so that the bought followers, they don't count as much as other. Do people buy followers nowadays? Do you know? Um, I lost track on that. <laughs> yeah, I don't think, you know, I have no idea if people still are buying followers. I wouldn't be surprised because, you know, if you don't know, um, you know, you might fall into that trap. But I wouldn't recommend anyone to do it. Uh, the systems are so advanced today. Yeah. Uh, but we do do audits when we work with clients where we look at how many, like on a Twitter account, if you have loads and loads and loads of followers, especially like the really large accounts, it's quite interesting to see how many are active and engaged and actually on the platform, not robots, uh, not fake accounts and, and such. So, you know, there are ways to verify that you have actual followers. And and it's all about engagement these days. If you buy followers, mm. you, you won't create engagement. No, that's so true. No, because it's funny when you see that there are no new players coming, especially into the, the I mean, I mostly operate in the language industry and, and you see new play, players coming in. We know that this is a fairly small industry. And after only, you know, a couple of months, a new player have 50,000 followers on Twitter. That's like, mm, do we even have 50,000 people in this industry? Mm-hmm. And who else would be interested in following them? So, yeah, I think people still do it, but we should keep in mind that the systems are much clever, much more clever than they were in the early days of social media. So we can't fool them anymore. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, it's all about, you know, what am I trying to get out of it? You know, when when I work with clients, we all always talk about the first step, which is what are the objectives? What are we trying to achieve here? Uh, Because only when we know that we can set up a strategy and tactics and we can measure towards that to make sure that not only, you know, am I getting engagement, am I getting likes or whatever I feel is important, but am I getting the right conversion? And I think that's being discussed way too little when it comes to why am I doing this? Uh, Because it has to convert, otherwise it's it's not gonna be worth the time. Um, So it's important to sort of understand, okay, so what am I trying to do? And also then build that journey build that message journey so that there is a way to convert. Because if I just sit there and talk, but there is no call to action anywhere, if it's, you know, am I driving traffic to my website? Am I trying to impact my search um, position so that I can be more easily found on Google? What am I trying to do? Um, And then when we know that, we can start helping on on what should you be doing and what, what tools should you be using? Otherwise, it is just like many people think it is a waste of time. And this is what I heard a lot when uh, I joined Twitter. I think it was 2009 and people said, oh, my God, it's such a waste of time. But Twitter to me, I mean, I think that the different media serves different purposes. And and Twitter to me has always been like the radio. Uh, it can be constantly on in the background, but I'm not paying attention all the time. I'm listening for, for special lines or, or clues that, you know, will catch my interest. And then I pay attention for five minutes and then I'm doing something else. Whilst a media like LinkedIn, I go there much more on purpose. I, I want to share something. I, I want to engage. I see an article. I read an article. I can spend an hour easily on LinkedIn, browsing the content and engaging with my audience or with other people's audiences. And that's what really fascinates me is how you see how you can link to people that you otherwise would never reach just because, Mm -hmm. you know, how you are connected. 
Can so I comment on something yeah. on the chat? Because I just saw yeah, that we, we have a comment um, from Frederick that says he didn't realize that employees liking, commenting and sharing company posts was ne negative. I'm not saying it's negative, but it, it no. is a risk of, of ending up in a filter bubble. So it's quite common that when you post something, it's actually good to have people interact with that post early on, because if it's liked and especially commenting uh, so that you get a dialogue, because that that sort of rates higher, uh, that that will make that content fly, so to say. So it becomes shared with more people. But if it's the same people that like and comment and share your content every time, then we end up in that loop that Tess was talking about uh, and we have a filter bubble. So there we are looking at each other's content interacting with each other's content and that's that so so that's why we're just saying you know it's important to instead make sure because if you engage with other people that you want to have engaged in your content the fact that you engaged with them the, it's more likely that they will then see your post that that's going to be pushed forward because we have to be very frank you know very little of what we post ends up in front of somebody's screen yeah. There is so much content. So you really have to build up that audience over time on any platform. And Twitter mm -hmm. is like super quick and, and therefore, you know, hashtags on, on Twitter is, is very important. You, you have to yeah. build engagement, but not at any cost or yeah, that's, 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 yeah, that's very nice. And I mean, hashtags, I'm, I'm just assuming the entire audience know ex exactly everything about hashtags. Uh, and I think, yeah, hashtags are super important. And knowing your hashtags, the industry yes. hashtags is one thing, but I sense that some people uh, tend to use them for people who are totally clueless. I mean, we are using L10N, XL8, I9N, whatever abbreviations we use for hashtags in our industry. And, and that's cool if I'm selling to another translation industry peer, but it's not cool if I'm trying to reach an audience outside of my own interests. So, so what's your take on the hashtags, Sansi? Well, I think that you have to do your research to be able to reach your audience. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, it's very easy for me to st stand here and say, oh, you should be doing this and you should be doing that because I've got tech, tech platforms for everything. So, um, you know, I have uh, social media monitoring where I listen to topics and there I get on a display uh, in my dashboard exactly what hashtags are relevant for that uh, that topic. Um, but you can do that manually as well if you don't have the tech. Uh, but it's just, you have to understand if I want to take a position in a certain market landscape, as you would if it wasn't digital as well, you know, what do I need to do? What do I need to understand? What does it look like? What's the conversation? What is resonating? What, what drives dialogue and bus? Uh, and, and today there are quite a lot of good, good tech uh, to help you on that journey. Uh, so I think it's important that you understand what hashtags to use. You shouldn't overuse hashtags. You know, we don't want posts that has one sentence and then <laughs> 30 hashtags. And it's like, what was this about? You know, so, so it's like always a balance, um, but using the right ones and also not be afraid to actually establish one. It's like a bit rough in the beginning when nobody is following it, but it is amazing if it starts flying and you know that that hashtag is, you know, people relate that to you. Um, so to do that for events, for instance, and they can live on for a long time, depending on how you treat them. Um, so, so there are some, some fun things and ideas that you can do with hashtags as well. Also to bring them into the physical space. Yeah. So and also to, uh, to test them, to test them, to test them, to test them, because, yes. I mean, you don't want to be associated with something that might be totally different. And as many of, of you might know, I'm, I'm very much engaged with, with local. And when we started uh, more actively be on social media, we realized that local is for 
people with dreadlocks and those kinds of hair. And so we couldn't only use the hashtag globe world because we, we had tons of followers that were following that, that tag. So that's why we always added numbers to the conferences, a so globe worldwide with a certain number. And uh, so that's, yeah, that's super interesting. But I, we have a comment here. And just for the audience to know, we will have uh, questions and answers, uh, 30 minutes of them from the audience. So we would love to have your, your questions and you can add them in the Q&A. But we are also trying to monitor the comments. And we have one here from, from Christina Jagman, who says, my big challenge is exactly that, finding the right audience for my content. I don't feel comfortable with tagging people. I am not in touch person with people who I am not in personally in touch with. How do I solve that? Can you just tag anyone? Can I say, I don't know, a celebrity's name just to draw more attention to my posts? What, what, what's, the, uh, what's the rule here? What do you think, Ansi? I, <laughs> yes, um, you know, I, I can understand the, um, it's, it's kind of interesting that people would do that even, um, you know, I think it's super important that if you tag somebody, either it's because you've, you want to boost them and acknowledge them that they've done something great and you're super impressed. Uh, but that has to be very genuine and, and sort of transparent. You can't tag people just to bring in your own brand. People see through that all the time. So, so, you know, so be careful with that, I think. Um, and then of course, you know, you can definitely, if you've, you know, I see people when they listen to a good podcast or if they uh, see something like really good in, in content that you recommend that. That's one thing. But just, you know, casually bring somebody into a post. No, like that. I wouldn't recommend that at all. I so, think it has to be relevant. For example, yeah. like when um, Anne-Marie shared our uh, panel in advance on LinkedIn and then she can tag us because we're involved. <laughs> Right. It has to be very relevant. But I wanted to bring back a question to Ansi that I saw in the chat too. back to the tags, hashtags, not the tags, the hashtags. Yes, uh, because I'm speaking for freelancers here and we don't have those big data systems behind us. How do we find the hashtags that work? You can always manually search um, in the platforms. So you can always go in and, and sort of look around on uh, hashtags that you think are relevant yeah. um, and just see, is this what, what I'm looking for? And once you start looking at posts for one hashtag, you will also see if people are using other hashtags. Yeah. So it's just like a, a more manual way of doing it. Uh, but it's still you can still do that uh, to sort of understand what's relevant. Um, and there are some, I'm just trying to say, see now, but there are some, some ways also to search on hashtags through Google and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, but I would, I usually go to the platform because they can vary, you know, mm -hmm. on Instagram that, you know, certain yes. hash, uh, hashtags are used in one way and in LinkedIn another way and Twitter a third way. So, uh, but it's always interesting to see like what is used in a certain topic base so that I get more options to choose from and see, is this the type of uh, feed that I would like to be part of? And I, I've noticed uh, when you said not to add as many hashtags, uh, it, it's, it also differs on the different platforms. I have noticed that Instagram is notorious for the one yeah. sentence and 30 hashtags. Yeah, but that's all about the image, right? Yeah. So, so you know, and uh, I think that that's also you, you sort of had, have to understand uh, a bit more about the platform. But then it's also um, I find it really, really interesting since we work so, work a lot with target groups and finding target groups for our clients and and target group mapping um, that it behaves in one way for one type of target group in a different way for another target group mm -hmm. like um you know if you're a millennial you will post and interact and write and use emojis in one way if you're uh, gen z it will be something totally different so depending on who you're marketing to and what platform you're on uh, there are going to be sort of different 
strict rules. Yes. Um, and I think that a lot of people just, we try to learn as we go, uh, yep. but just research. I think that we have to be curious and mm -hmm. see it as something fun. Um, as soon as something feels like, oh, this is way too time consuming, I can't be bothered, then it's probably not the right platform for you. Yep. Uh, so so it's, it's it has to be a bit of, of fun and curiosity and uh, just be able to try it. And I can recommend if you just if you go with uh, quantity before quality, you can always uh, use the hashtag dogs of Twitter. I started the Twitter account just to test it for my dog. And she got 700 followers within 15 hours. And I didn't oh, buy wow. one single one of them. So that's just if you want quantity, use that hashtag. Um, moving on a little bit. Um, the, 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 the private side, how this is something that I'm sort of in my position struggle with a little bit because I am a brand, I have my brand, I have my persona and I have my private self. How do you feel about that gray zone? Where do you share private stuff and where can you earn more, more presence or, or more followers by becoming more personal? And is there a line that you shouldn't cross? What do you think, Tess? Uh, that this is probably why I am most active for my business on social media. I don't think you should post anything that you don't want your grandmother to know or anybody else. I think even if you have a small sphere on one social media platform, it can still leak out. So don't post anything that you don't want the whole world to know, basically. Um, and another thing that I think is important is to always um, Google yourself because you can moderate what's out there a little bit. If you see something there, for example, a picture that you think, oh, my God, I don't want that picture to be out there. You can have it removed. So does that That's answer your very question? Good. Yes, I think so. Yes. And again, I think also that coming back to the strategy, I'm often... I often talk about strategies and, and I think that is also important for your personal brand to, to, to have a strategy where you yes. want to do what. So you can be private on Facebook and only have your closest friend and then you can have your corporate side and you can have anyone to join the conversation there. So you can have different strategies for the different platforms, right? Definitely. And I mean, I think that I've been struggling a bit uh, these last couple of weeks since Clubhouse came on, because at yeah. Clubhouse, you can link uh, your Twitter account and your Instagram account. So those are the two platforms it links to. And I have a private uh, Instagram account um, in my, my name, the one that everybody knows about, uh, where I have very few followers. It's, it's you know, it's a private account. And then I have an open account because I'm a gardening nerd. So mm -hmm. that's where I post, you know, all the stuff on the gardening I do, uh, trying to understand how I can grow even more tomatoes next year, uh, that kind of interesting stuff. Um, and then you enter Clubhouse and you go, oh, yeah. yeah. So the most natural thing would be to have me link my private account because that has the right name but it's closed yeah. and it's closed for mm -hmm. one reason only. And it's because I post pictures of my kids. I have the same um, issue with Instagram yeah. and I think I'm going to change my headline because right now it says that I'm a translator and marketing trainer, uh, but it's closed and I actually keep it only for my people that I really know. Um, I think I'm going to change the headline because I have a private one and I have a public one. And uh, I'll, I have a lot of requests uh, from translators for my private one because it's my name. Yeah. Um, but I would prefer if they use my my public one, which is my marketing tips for translators. So that is, it's, it's an issue. Yeah, yeah but it's kind of funny. In. I, I've actually, so I, what I did eventually, and I've, I've gone back and forth, so you know, but I haven't opened my, my private account. I actually uh, decided, no, I'm going to connect my, my public Instagram account because I am going into how to clubhouse rooms on gardening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's actually now meant that I'm starting to get followers on my public Instagram account because, you know, there is a cluster in clubhouse of 
um, you know, hobby gardeners, uh, professional gardeners, lots of experts that share. Um, so, you know, it is what it is. I do get some business content on that Instagram account now because I have other people as well that I interact with there. But it was just, you know, the best way to do it for me right now. Uh, we'll see when the kids, as long as they're, you know, time, they're not super young, they're eight and 12, but I respect the fact that they don't want to be uh, open. They don't have their own social media accounts either. So um, that's how we're going to keep it in this family for a bit. But that's why you have to sort of decide what's best for me, for us, and, and how do I want to do it. Uh, on Twitter, I'm most active on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Clubhouse right now. Um, mm -hmm. So that's how I do it. And I, I post occasionally on Facebook as well. But that's just because in, on Facebook, I have a broader network. Uh, it's also a, a private account but i have a lot of business connections in that um as well same with me yes yeah and that is what happens over, over time you might be business associates only in the beginning and then you grow into a friendship and then yeah so there is yeah. a you know a gray zone you have to decide but i think it needs it's really important to underline that you need to be true to yourself what feels comfortable for you and as we talked about this, I mean, what you can expect from your employees to engage, it's, it's the same thing. If you have people who don't want to be, you have to respect that. Yeah. But I also like, I saw that in the comment here, that one thing about the tagging people, that if you are to, that person wrote that if I tag a person, I always ask their consent first yeah. before I do it. And I think that's a really nice way to do it. And I think that can also go alongside with if you run a business that, yeah, it would be great if I have 10 employees and they all look professional on LinkedIn because you have a, a bigger chance that someone will find your company if you have your people on LinkedIn. Yeah. But you have to ask their consent. And if they don't want to, it's it, that's okay. So I think that's, it's, it's, this level of being authentic and true to yourself and do what you like. Can I, can I add something on this sort of being personal, uh, just a, a sort of anecdote. Um, I had, it's, it's many years now. Um, um, I had an incident where a business meeting went terribly wrong. You know, things happen. Um, Online? At, uh, no, it was a physical uh, meeting okay. many years ago. And, uh, we were doing. Um, um, we were we were going through a report, an analysis report, an insights report that we had done, and it was totally uh, misunderstood what we meant in a certain state uh, statement. Um, and somebody took that very personally. And that's always hard when you work in analysis and insights because people tend to feel like they're being um, graded, like, oh, it's a you know performance report. And it really wasn't. So for us, it was, you know, just this has happened. This is what you look like in media. This is what we think are the opportunities and, and what you could do in social media. And we didn't, didn't think it would be such a big thing. But for an individual in that meeting, it was. And I felt terrible. This was somebody I really admired, respected. I knew uh, this person was really good at um, her job. Um, and she, she's fantastic. And I hurt her and I felt so bad. And I spoke to her afterwards. I spoke to lots of people afterwards. And it ended up that I actually felt like it was afterwards I realized that this is interesting because we very rarely talk about mistakes we do at work mm -hmm. because when I started analyzing this situation I realized that if I had taken a few steps back it was in a time period when I was super stressed at work way too much to do and I was just like rushing through just trying to get everything done but if I had taken a step back I could have foreseen this you know, I could have done it differently and I had to own it. I owned it to her, but I also decided to record a video and put it up on LinkedIn to talk about how difficult it is when you realize that you messed up. Mm -hmm. You messed up, you hurt somebody and you had to ask for forgiveness. That video was so 
strong. It was so hard to do. I did it in one take because I thought if I do, if I tried to do it several times, it's not going to be, I just have to be authentic. So mm-hmm. I did it in one take, put it up, and it had such a reaction in many ways. People were coming back to me and like, oh, are you getting burnt out? No, I wasn't. I was just stressed that week. <laughs> you know, uh, People were like, oh my God, I wish more people would talk about mistakes they do. Um, fuck ups if if we can use that word and now there are pods on this there are you know people write books on it but to me it was an eye opener that and i haven't been that personal or shared that type of content again but it was just so obvious to me that you have to stop and think and mm-hmm. and so i think that we can be personal but it has to be in a relevant context if you're going to put it out as something in in the professional realm of your of your space. Let me let me bring us back a little bit to uh, the other media's. I mean, I know that we are all social media freaks here, but we we still have that good old website and our blog. Are those times over? Can we close them down, or or how do you see the the um, interaction between the social media and the more static, which, I mean, that is more static for most companies, at least. How do you see that um, developing over? Do you want me to start? Yeah, sure. Tess, please. I think a website, uh, if you go into the physical world and uh, you have a, a store or a boutique, the website is that. And... Um, All the marketing and all the social media is just to bring people to your website because that's where you can um, have your message. You own it um, on that website and uh, this is where you can bring them into your store, tell them about you more and um, hopefully create a call to action, a click, a contact and stuff like that. Social media is great but it should all bring you back to, I, I think the social media, you have to have a storefront somewhere. Yeah. Do you agree, Ansi? I totally agree. And it's so, so true. And I think that most, um, especially smaller companies, and I know that from, from being one uh, before uh, being an entrepreneur, um, often forget that call to action. We tend to, uh, once again, you know, we put our storefront up uh, and we think that, oh, but I have a button at the side, contact me or f- to book me as a speaker or something like that. But you really have to, um, once again, follow the data. Uh, so are my are, are people coming here and interacting? How long are they staying on the page? Where are they going? You know, how have I built it? Because there is a, a, an art form on, on building good pages. And they also build up the SEO so that you show up on Google, that you have control of that, just as we spoke about earlier, not only as a personal brand, but also the company brand. Mm -hmm. Um, And of course, it's all interconnected. It should be. You should link your social accounts to your websites and vice versa, because that builds the SEO as well. Uh, But that's the same with anything you do. Like, are you putting out press releases? You need to think about the whole ecosystem and how it works for you. Because if you do that, you will get much more conversion at the end. But just thinking that, you know, somebody's gonna read like a long, 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 long text and then click on that button, probably not gonna happen. So how do I need to to create my website so that it becomes intriguing enough so people reach out? How do I make that happen? Uh, And and once again, it just takes um, listening to all of the ecosystem, understanding what type of content. If you have a blog, what resonates in social media? So you should do an in-depth or do a video on YouTube or wherever you are, what, what channels you've chosen. Um, to build that and then always connect it to so you have that anchor of your website so definitely and And which leads sorry which leads me actually because I'm I'm monitoring the time here which leads me to the fact that it all needs to be cohesive it can be different strategies can be different but it needs to be cohesive and it needs to confirm to your potential buyer 
what they think they already know about you and your company so that they feel, wow, yeah, that's what I thought. I want to buy from them. So uh, we are going to open up for questions. We have monitored a little bit in the chat and we have the Q&A in, in, if you're on Zoom. If you are in any other media following us live on Facebook, we have assistants working with us, helping us to post your questions into the Q&A uh, chat in Zoom. But before, uh, before we do that, I will ask to, to um, give the audience another message from our sponsor. This Q&A is brought to you by Lionbridge. So let me open up. And I think the first question that I saw here was um, related to websites. So do you ever use AdWords? And if so, did you find it useful? I I have not used AdWords for my website, uh, but I wanted to come back to the, the, the question about blogs and whether they are relevant still. Um, so one way to increase your SEO and make people find your website is through blog posts. And I think it depends on the industry, but our industry, especially translators, still like to read sometimes instead of watching. Uh, I know personally, if somebody posts a video, I save it for later. But the blog post I can read through or skim through kind of quickly. So um, the website and the blog post are not dead. They have a function still. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to talk about AdWords. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I would say yes. Uh, depend, but depending on what market you're in and what you're trying to sell. Um, we do quite a lot of research where we also look into uh, when it comes to like market approaches and, and strategies and, and tactics. Um, and there is definitely um, markets and audiences that trigger really well when it comes to, to AdWords, but it's all about uh, checking how much uh, competition is it on the words that I want to, um, to then sort of market on? Uh, is it going to be worth it? Um, the good thing with Google is that you can put a cap on how much you spend. So you can try it out and see what happens with the traffic that I get uh, when I use AdWords. Is it actually converting? Once again, not only driving traffic to a website, because it doesn't matter if you're paying heaps uh, to get traffic to your website, but it's not converting. You know, it's like pouring water into a leaky bucket. So, so you have to make sure that the whole system works. Uh, but it can be very, very good. Uh, and I would just say, once again, be curious, get to know how to do it and try but follow the data to see if it's the right tactic for you. I, Very okay, good I advice. Wanna, I want to add, you have to also localize, If since we're in the localization business. Yes. Uh, yes. I work a lot with localizing or transcreating ads these days, and you have to have somebody that knows SEO, that knows about negative keywords, that knows what you need to change in order to reach that audience and create engagement in that market with your ads. So, so true. So, so true. Excellent. So the next question is from Hans Pich. And I know that we, uh, we knew that we were online, Hans. And that's why we uh, talked our secret language before <laughs> we, we went live. But you do have a question. What do you recommend to companies that want to use social media in different languages? Should, should, um, should it be done via central account or should each language get its own account? That's a very good question. And I always, yeah. Ansi, what do you think? Should we have that all mixed in the same account or should we have language specific streams? I actually don't have a good answer for this one because I've seen so many different strategy and tactics done uh, because there is a big problem with the fact that it takes time to build an audience for any account, no matter how big uh, of a company you are and how big the interest is uh, when it comes to, to um, your content. Um, 
Because we, you always have to balance the fact that if you post on different languages in the same um, same account, uh, uh, that it won't be relevant for the audience all the time. I would say that it also depends on what platform we're talking about. Uh, because, you know, with Twitter, I follow, I don't know how many, you know, a lot of accounts. And I don't read my feed. I usually go in and search on like a hashtag mm -hmm. if I want to if I want to look at something on or a person that I follow. Uh, so it becomes quite different on Twitter. But I would say that there is a good way to if you want to localize and I think you should. I mean, we do a lot of research on how messages and uh, languages, how important they are for conversion. So it's super important to use the local language and the local tactics that apply for that country. Big differences. Oh, that's an old, that's an all uh, different show. Uh, but also, when you market uh, what you call dark social, it, I know it sounds really weird, but you know, mm -hmm. marketed uh, uh, content is called dark uh, dark social. That's not something that shows up in your feed, but you can target it to your audience. Of course, you have to pay for this, but that also means that you know who's going to get it, and they can get it in their local language. So it doesn't disturb your feed. Instead, you can market that towards the right the right uh, target group in the right language. So that's what I usually see my clients use, uh, that they localize uh, on the central account, but doing it in dark. Tess, did you have anything to add to, to that? Uh, no, only that I do think it's important that you um, speak in the language of your customers and target language. So if you are a company and can can hire or uh, employ people that can have a, an account in that in in all your markets, I I would recommend that. If you are a one person company or a freelancer, like I am. Um, you, I recommend focusing on the language of your target audience mm -hmm. and speak in that yeah. language. And, this, and, this, and I also um, think, yeah, can I just add one, one way to also get around it is to mark on your profile what languages you are speaking in. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, if you're multi, just put the flags in there so mm -hmm. that people can say that, oh, this person is going to be um, communicating in several languages then people know. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a very smart idea. And also you can have different, again, different strategies depending. I mean, for for in the language industry, a lot of the uh, LSPs uh, have two different strategies in how and to whom they are selling. So in the local market, you might be targeting anything from pizzerias to, to law firms to, to your local bank. And those would probably be more engage with your social media if you then did that in Swedish in my case or in Czech or whatever language but on the international market they are selling to under other translation companies so they become subcontractors within their own industries so for that audience they should probably stick to English which is sort of the you know the the industry lingo that we have but one thing that I would like to, if you haven't noticed already, uh, on LinkedIn, on your professional profiles, you can have your profile in more than one language if you are comfortable in more than one language. And that is very good because that means that you will be found in searches in all of those different languages that you have your profile in. Don't do it in languages that you don't, <clears throat> that you don't master, but that's a very simple way of multiplying your presence on LinkedIn to do it in more than one language. So that's for your personal um, profile. Uh, we have another question here uh, from Maria asking, on social media, what type of content should we put out if we work with clients across different sectors and sizes? Good question. <laughs> Who wants to go first? Who yeah. has the magic answer? <laughs> I don't, I, have, I don't have a magic answer. Uh, I think this is something you would have to research and see what your target audience is engaging with and uh, find helpful and useful. Ansi, a comment to that? 
Yeah, well, I can only echo that because, I mean, it's it's all about what they feel relevant. And, it, and that is so hard to hear, right? Because you want to hear that, well, I have something to say and I want to put that across wherever I you know, where, I, where I'm trying to get business. But it's, it's really that social interaction that you need to, to have happening. But it's just a matter of, I usually try to think about what are they going through? What am I, what am I going to bring that is going to bring value to them? So I always think about the client's client. You know, is there anything that I can do that will help them uh, win deals and be more successful? Then I, I talk about that. And uh, for me, that can vary quite a lot, depending on if the client is in a certain industry or another industry. Uh, so I try to then find relevant like case studies or uh, tips and tricks that are relevant for that certain market. But then once again, the hashtags become super important because then I need to dive into their territory and their topic uh, so that they can they can read what I'm talking about. Uh, so it, once again, you know, research and understanding the data behind it and then build content that is relevant and drives both your business, but also your client's business. Very, yeah, very good. Um, I, I've been thinking a little bit also about, and I wanted to ask how, how you see that when people auto post from different medias into other medias. I mean, they all used to be different, but it's not only in the language industry that we had a constant merger uh, situation where companies grow into one. Uh, that happens also on social media, as we know. So I find it quite, I don't know, irritating would be a too strong of a word. But if you see a post and it says, look at this amazing, or uh, I've found something that was interesting, and that's posted from a private account, and it goes automatically into Twitter. So you can't actually access that information. You can see it on Twitter as a tweet, but you can't really follow it, or it goes to paid content. So it's Washington Post, you have to have a subscription, so you can't read it because of that. Or if there's a picture, and you don't see the picture on Twitter because it was posted somewhere else. It's a link to the picture. How, how do you balance that? Would you recommend to have this auto post? Everything goes into every, every media or should you be more delicate in, in how and when and with what you post where? What do you think, Amsi? If I don't, if I haven't seen the data, I couldn't tell you. Um, so, <laughs> uh, I'm such a data nerd. Um, I think that, you know, it's what I see quite a lot. I've seen an increase, um, at least in my feed. I'm just speaking from from my own experience, uh, you know, being on Twitter, that people are posting like LinkedIn posts more on Twitter. And I guess they do that to build the interest on LinkedIn, uh, that they're trying to drive tra traffic to um, their profile and the content that they're posting there. I have no idea if that is successful without watching data. Uh, I'm not doing it uh, on my own. Um, I use those two platforms quite differently. I use Twitter much more um, I actually use Twitter much more active to me I go on Twitter when I'm so when I want to interact with tweet chats and and sort of different communities that I'm part of or if I want to follow um, a hashtag or something like that so I don't really use it that in that way I might have to try just to see if if the data tells me that that's a good idea um, the now I see more connections between since I'm getting more active on clubhouse how that drives traffic to my Twitter account uh, since that's linked but but I think that you really have to think about why am I posting this what am I hoping to, to get out of it once again you know what what's the objective uh, what's showing that it's working and what's the call to action what's going to happen with this so I don't think it's a good if if it's like you said linking to closed content um, but on the other hand, I do schedule posts on several uh, social media at the same time, especially for my uh, marketing training. But what you can do is I, I schedule it in Hootsuite, which is a scheduling tool, and you can see what it looks like 
on all the different mm. social media you post it to then. So that way, I don't know if the instance... You can trim the times so, as well. Sorry? You can trim the times as well. So it doesn't have to post at the same exact same second. Yes. Because you can have different posting times. So yes. And that's, that's I think, I think is a different thing to post same content, uh, like you say, marketing and stuff. I mm -hmm. see that all the time. But, but the whole linking to a LinkedIn post, um, sometimes those auto uh, sort of spread things can look really weird. So it's mm -hmm. better to do like pure, like you say, a proper post for LinkedIn, for Twitter, and then just post it through a, three, a third party. Mm. So I agree. Very good. So and, and another thing that I have been, um, and I thought about topics for this conversation to see, um, do you think that there is a difference between how, now this is an all women uh, panel, so we cannot ask, any man in, in the panel, but is there a difference, do you think, how women and men relate to the, the digital presence? Is there a female way and a male way? I, I think so, just as it is um, how we interact in any social situation, we interact differently, and I think it's the same on social media. That said, I, I do, communicate and socialize with both all, all, all sides, all, all kinds of genders online. Um, but I do think that the interaction is different. So do you, do you actually have to build that into your strategy if you have a product or a service that is more geared towards, do you, do you need to, to behave differently, Ansi? Do you, do you have data on that? <laughs> <laughs> I would say yes. Um, because, and it's not a matter of being digital, we're humans. So, um, and I think that there are so many studies that show that we communicate in different ways, we express ourselves in different ways, we have different body language and, and everything, and that ties into digital as well. So, so um, um, and I wouldn't say that it's a matter of um, you know, do I need to change my ways because I'm communicating to men, uh, but more on, you know, if I'm going to talk about a certain technical topic, and that would be um, linked to a more male audience, uh, I just, I don't care about it being male, I just want to be on topic. So, so, um, so I think that it's all a matter of, you um, just being relevant and understanding what words to use, what lingo to use, uh, and, and sort of, it's like those social interactions in, in real life too. Um, but I definitely know of um, people in my network that have zoned in on only wanting female clients because it becomes, then they know exactly how to, to run the messaging and they, they get to know that audience really, really well. Um, and the same with on the other end, you know, somebody that says, no, I, I work better with men. So I'm targeting these type of industries and this is how I'm gonna work. So, so I would say, yes, because we're humans, there is a difference. But I think that uh, a lot of the um, sort of coding in language and um, how we socialize, is very similar that we're we're seeing in the workspace or um you know when we socialize on events and stuff if you right. would sit down with um, um a male colleague uh next to you we are all females and you would both open TikTok or instagram reels uh you would be surprised how different the content is that you get in those. That's just one proof of how the algorithm even tailors the content oh, yeah. to different. Oh yeah. So it's Another, different worlds. Yeah. Um, the different medias, I mean, um, what I kind of dislike now is that they are all becoming so alike, you know? Mm -hmm. It used to be Instagram and stories that was wonderful. Then suddenly stories were also on Facebook. Now we have fleets on Twitter. Um, how do you feel about that? 
Is that an issue or is it good so that we can do everything the same on all the different platforms or, or was it better in the good old days? I guess it's good if you only focus on one platform, you can get it all from that platform. But I think it's mostly the, the company, the social media companies who are thinking like, oh, they're doing that. We need to do that too. What about yeah. you, Anthony? Well, I think that I'm, oh, this one is really difficult because I'm more curious and I, I haven't read up on that, on how these functionalities are actually being used. Because it's one thing that the uh, social platforms get envious of each other and starts, uh, you know, providing the same functionality. But will it fly? That's the difference. Will we use it? Will it lead to something? Um, so I'm sort of. It is a problem in the sense that if the algorithm the algorithm starts like now, you know, with LinkedIn as well, you know, you need to post all these different content types and you have to do this and that, and, you know, because, you know, to feed the cookie monster, mm -hmm. um, it puts a pressure on anyone on that platform and it can be quite overwhelming. Uh, but I'm, I'm thinking that eventually um, I think it will clean itself out because if we don't like it and interact with it they they will not be able to make money on it because i mean let's be frank i mean they try to sell ads they try to make us sort of they we pay in our time uh with content um and ads and if that doesn't work eventually they will take it take it out because that will take attention off from the platform so we'll see what happens with all these different ones. Um, but I think that, you know, as soon as it is a hype, I mean, now we have Clubhouse that everybody talks about and all of a sudden all the other uh, platforms are also going to have like an audio only uh, yeah. just to sort of deliver on that. So I think that um, I'm, I've been in digital for such a long time. I kind of just step back as like, here we go again. And then we'll see. <laughs> That's, yeah, that's sort of what I feel about Clubhouse. I'm very new to Clubhouse. Sometimes I turn it on as a radio in the background, but I'm not super active. And but it, well, that was my thing. Oh no, here we go again. <laughs> <laughs> but I think what I what, what I really let's talk about a little bit about Clubhouse. I mean, what I like about Clubhouse is because the language industry is such a small pond and we tend to talk to each other, the same people, the same influences. And now there are so many of us um, building our personal brands. We podcast, I mean, I love podcasts in the beginning. Disclaimer here, Tess, I love your podcast, but I'm not a big podcast consumer. And now there are tons of podcasts geared towards our industry, in our industry. And what I really like now in the beginning, in the early days of Clubhouse, is that I get to listen in to a lot of different industries that I otherwise never pay attention to mm -hmm. in, the, in the marketing clubs or, or the different you know, sections that you can follow. And that, to me, is fascinating. And I hope that we, as an industry, can learn from other industries because yeah we're we're all great but i do think that we we have areas where we can make improvements so and as you said anzi i mean facebook was there immediately announcing that we have something similar we are going to do this as well uh so yeah and it's you know i, I kind of like uh, even though um it's kind of brilliant that the fact that they take out the video and go audio only and they make it like a radio show and instead of calling into a radio show you can ask to get on up on stage and ask your questions um, so the technology is quite simple actually uh, but you know the scalability is hard um, and, and to be able to do that but but so it's, it's an in interesting interesting platform but it's also quite it quickly turns into different bubbles so even though you can move around and go into all these rooms, I get a feeling that people tend to sort of end up now in the same rooms, talking to the same people. And, and you know, and I've spoken with quite a lot of people on Clubhouse with the fact that there are the, the mix of people is exciting, that you can have as it started with entrepreneurs and VCAP. 
uh, coming onto this platform and, and sort of finding alliances. Uh, and now we're seeing other sort of people finding each other. But will we do anything different? Will we act? Because it's only when we act and something good comes out of these collaboration sort of platforms, no matter if it's Clubhouse or Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn, you know, will we make the world a little bit better? Because I think it's very driven out of that because it's from the startup scene when, and also a lot in sustainability. So, so it's interesting to follow, but, uh, but I like it. I think it's, it's a fun, uh, very sort of naked way when it's audio only, when I don't have to care about a camera, I can be in my pajamas and, and you know, I can clean the kitchen while, yes. while I listen. It's just something refreshing. I know. And that's why <clears throat> I have it on. But what I was questioning in the beginning is it's by invitation only. Yeah. We, during the beta, during the yeah. beta. Okay, that will I'm... that will most likely change, and that has happened with other other medias as well. Uh, that it's yeah, by invitation yeah, yeah, yeah. only in the beginning. And by the way, if anyone who listens now got super curious about Clubhouse, I do have few invitations. So if I you do too. send me, <laughs> if you send me a nice too. message, I might share. <laughs> No, and I think that, you know, we have to be aware that it is beta. It's still only uh, deployed for iPhones. Um, yeah. And, you know, they, they're not on Android yet. So I, we've only seen the beginning. I mean, it, it, it has been around for a few months and it's been very much talked about uh, the last month or, or two. Uh, but, you know, it's still it's still just in its cradle. It's just starting off. And it's funny, you said in a, a couple of minutes ago, but I mean, we, after all, we are all humans. And, and when you describe what is happening now on Clubhouse, that we tend to go to the same club, we tend to talk to the same people. Isn't that exactly what we are doing in a social networking environment too? We tend to go to the people we know. If you, you know, yeah. if you are, even if you are at a conference, a physical conference, you can network with whoever you want. There are 200 people in the room. You tend to go to the people that you know, and that's where you hang out, and that's where you stay. So I think. Yeah, but um, I think that that's why you have to push yourself and be that curious person that taps somebody on the shoulder and says hello and get to know them, because that's how you create new business, right? Because if you stay in the same pool and you know you think that you will always renew whatever you're trying to sell, like that contract, uh, you will not grow. So to get scalability, we need to look somewhere else. We need to learn from others. And we need to reach out and say, hey, I want to get to know you uh, and, and be that vulnerable. And of course, it's super scary because somebody could actually shut the door on you. Uh, most don't. Most step back and say, oh, hi, great. And you start talking. I have so many new conversations on LinkedIn where I do most of my networking. Uh, but it, it's all about taking that first step. Don't sit and wait for somebody else to take it. Very good. Um, we are almost running out of time. And um, I just wanted to, before we close the room, I know this has been recorded. So if you had to drop out early or if you came in late, there is a second chance or third, or you can watch it as or listen to it as many times as you want. A um, few last words, uh, Tess. If we have any newbies on the on the digital journey here in the audience, what would be your your top advice to to uh, to give to them? Where where should they start? Um, they should start with thinking about what what they want to achieve. On, with the social social presence. And then once they know that, they can pick a platform uh, that they uh, think they can achieve this on. Uh, so for me or for fellow linguists, it is uh, think about where your, um, not only your colleagues, but where your clients hang out. Go to that platform, see if they're active, if they're groups, if they're hashtags and stuff, and um, create a presence and start interacting there. And and enjoy it. Have some fun. Don't think of it as another as another time waste. Uh, it it will be a time waste if you don't have in the back of the head what you want to achieve all the time. Ansi, well, pretty much the same. I always say 
start with listen, listen, listen. If you start listening to conversations where you feel that this is a topic there where I should have a position, just listen to it. What's being said? What are people reacting to? How can I tap into that? Uh, because then you can move on on sort of setting, just as Tess said, your objectives and your strategic and your tactics. Uh, but but do your research. So so listen, listen, listen. Um, that's that's my starting point always. Yeah, you need to go out and spy for a while, and then you can interact. Wonderful. Uh, I want to say uh, thank you, Ansi and Tess. It was wonderful to have you here uh, on this webinar today. I also would like to, to express my, my appreciation to Multilingual, who invited me to host this panel. And I hope to see many of you soon again, either online in the digital world or who knows, maybe even physically soon. So until we meet again, stay healthy, wash your hands and have fun. Bye.